In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And there was evening and there was morning. The first day. Then God painted the sky and formed the ocean. And there was evening and there was morning. The second day. Then God raised dry land up out of the ocean. The mountains came roaring out of the waters, reaching for the heavens. And there was evening and there was morning. The third day. And God made the sun to govern the day and the moon to haunt the night. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Then God said, let the water teem with living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Then God scooped up the dust of the earth and he breathed into it the breath of life. God created humanity out of the dust, the dirt, out of the raw matter of the earth we were created. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Creation was complete. So on the seventh day, God rested. And that's the story of creation in the Bible. In the very first book, the first chapter of the entire Bible, if you open it up, you'll get to Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter 1, that was basically it. And if you keep reading on through Genesis and the rest of the Bible, the Bible records how old the first humans, Adam and Eve, lived to be, and how many kids they had. Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel. Cain lived so many years, and he had a child named Enoch. And Enoch lived so and so many years, and then he begat Arad. Then Arad begat Mahujula. Mahujala begat Methuselah, etc., so on and so forth, and it just keeps going, these genealogies, all the way down to Jesus in AD 33, giving us a timeline of existence. And if you assume these Bible dates are literal, then you could work backwards and roughly approximate how long ago God created the universe. And some wise guys, some Christians, decided to do that. They added up all of these generations and the years and the genealogies in the Bible, and they pinpointed the date of creation. They said, God created the world in 4004 B.C. on October the 22nd, around 6 o'clock-ish. This would mean that the world, the stars and the planets and the species and all of you lovely people and all the matter and atoms, all of it would only have been in existence for 6,000 years. And this belief is called creationism. Repeat after me, creationism. Creationism. Creationism is the belief that God created the world 6,000 years ago, and that it all happened the exact, literal way the Bible says it did. Creationism says the earth is young. It's only 6,000 years old, which is pretty young in cosmic terms. Creationism says that everything was created in a literal seven days, just like the Bible says it was. So all the species that have ever existed, all the animals that died and we have fossils of, everything 
was created in the same week as humans. Which would mean, for a little while at least, dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. Which means that it is possible that this happened. <laughs> <laughs> so creationism was the main view among Christians for thousands of years. Then something happened. Or rather, someone happened. In the 1800s, there was a young man training to become a pastor. He was studying at Cambridge and reading the Bible, and he was memorizing Bible verses. And while he was training, he was given an opportunity to go on a journey, a voyage across the world on the HMS Beagle. For five years, he sailed across the world, visiting new exotic locations, boldly going where no white man had gone before. And on his journey, he kept records. He had always loved science, and so he sketched all the new species that he was encountering. And one part of his journey was particularly exciting. Nearly a thousand miles off the coast of South America is a small cluster of islands, almost entirely untouched by civilization. The Galapagos Islands. Well, in the Galapagos, the young man noticed something. What a species looked like changed depending on which one of the Galapagos Islands he was on. The finches all looked different. They had different beak size. On one island, they had longer beaks. On another island, they had drastically smaller beaks. In the same way, the tortoises on one island were completely different from that on a different island. The same species looked radically different depending on their location, what is going on. And the more the young man thought about it, the more he realized that the species were adapting to their location. On the islands that had more fruit, the finches had bigger beaks for chewing the fruit up. But on the Galapagos Islands, where there were lots of little seeds, their beaks were smaller and more precise for picking out the seeds. The finches were changing, adapting, evolving to fit their circumstances. On the fruit island, the finches that had bigger beaks were more likely to survive than the finches with smaller beaks. So the small beaked finches ate less because they couldn't eat the fruit. They died earlier, and so they had less time to reproduce, and their genes eventually disappeared. But the big beaked finches had big enough beaks to eat the fruit, so they ate more, lived longer, had more time to reproduce, had more babies, and so their genetics were passed on more often and flooded the gene pool. And the young man reasoned that if this process were repeated over many generations, in each generation the number of small beaked birds will decrease until eventually they disappear from that island altogether. Nature is selecting what traits survive in a species, and which ones will die out. And the young man called this natural selection. Natural selection means that every time you kill a spider, you are actually making the spider gene pool sneakier and more deadly. So let's take a moment to pray about that. <laughs> so, the young man used natural selection to account for all the variations within the species that he saw on the islands. But he wondered, 
What if it could do more than that? If natural selection could radically alter a species within a few generations, what could it do over, say, a million years? What if over millions of years, the slight changes and differences within a species built up until it was so different from where it started that it was now a whole new species altogether? What if slowly, over millions of years, the body structure of a species slowly warped and evolved, and eventually, a leg could become a fin, or a fin could become a leg? What if creationism is wrong? What if the species were not created all at once by God, but instead, evolved over millions and millions of years, so many years that brain, your brain can't even handle how many years that is. What if the world wasn't created 6,000 years ago, but instead was created billions of years ago, allowing enough time for slow, incremental changes to build up and create all the new species we see today? What if God didn't snap his fingers and create Adam and Eve in one day, but instead, humanity is the end product of millions of years of natural selection and evolution. What if apes and humans share a common ancestor? What if humanity was not created in the image of God, but is just a highly evolved monkey? What if every species on earth is actually related, and if you go far enough back, we all come from the same single-celled incestuous organism? What if there is a tree of life, and ultimately we all came from the same root, and it is only over millions of years that the species have branched out and evolved? And when the dust had settled, he realized he hadn't just explained the mystery of the Galapagos. He had explained everything. So in 1959, he published his ideas in one great big book. The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. The young man was Charles Darwin, the father of modern evolutionary theory. Evolution is one of the boldest and most awe-inspiring stories ever told. Attempting to explain every living being that has existed, does exist, and ever will exist. It's the story of me of you, of humanity. It's the story of the birds in the air, the spiders in the attic, the dinosaurs buried in the ground, the fish in the sea, and the slaughtered cows on our dinner plates. Every living thing connected and caught up in the grand dance of evolution. Darwin had set out to explain the Galapagos, and he ended up explaining everything. Darwin had replaced the old Bible stories with a new story of evolution. Darwin had undermined creationism. And that scared Darwin. He, he still had some faith left. He'd once trained to be a pastor, after all. Darwin still wanted to be a Christian, but he didn't know how it all worked with God. Is it possible to be a Christian and believe in evolution? Is creationism the only option for Christians? These were the debates Darwin was having with himself in his own head, caught up with anxiety, not knowing. And while he was still having these debates and questions and wrestling with what he thought, his daughter Annie was born. Annie Darwin was the apple of her father's eye, his greatest treasure on earth. 
she was very affectionate. She'd always come up to him and smooth his hair out and pat his clothes back into place. She was bright, inquisitive, honest, sensitive, joyful, profound, beautiful. And she was also very sick. Her health began fading over nine months as Charles watched helplessly, praying, God save her. But at the age of ten, Annie Darwin died. Charles wrote a memorial for her the week after she died, saying, quote, I see her face before me now as if she were just running down the stairs towards me. We have lost the joy of our household and the solace of our old age. She must have known how we loved her. Oh, that she could have now know how deeply, how tenderly we do still and shall ever love her. The death of Annie changed Darwin forever. He later became an atheist. He didn't believe in God anymore. And some Christians say, well, Darwin was just angry at God about Annie dying. Evolution and science didn't make him an atheist. His daughter's death did it. And besides that being somewhat offensive, it's a complete misunderstanding. Because Annie's death and the theory of evolution are not two separate things. No, Annie died because she was less well adapted genetically to her environment than the other children. She got sick and wasn't strong enough to survive. Natural selection weeds out the weaknesses in the gene pool and Annie was selected to be left behind. Annie's death was not something separate from Darwin's theories. No, her death was the prime example of what evolution is. In order for the species to evolve forward, millions of less fit beings have to die. Evolution only moves forward atop a billion corpses. What kind of God does that? What kind of God would let a little girl die? so the gene pool can grow and evolve. What kind of God would make a world where the only way forward is through the deaths of billions of creatures that were deemed unfit and left behind in the march of evolution? And so, Darwin believed that evolution and God were not compatible. He believed in atheistic evolution. And many followed his lead. Evolution comes to be associated with atheism, the belief that God does not exist. And people begin to take sides. Creationism versus evolution. God versus Darwin. Science versus religion. Galileo part two. Many religious people retreat to creationism, thinking, well, this is the only way we can stay Christian, because if we become evolutionists, we got to give up our faith. They deny science and what's going on in biology class, and they just keep reading the Bible in isolation and believing the earth is 6,000 years old. And on the opposite end, many people see the evidence for evolution, say, well, I can't deny that, and think they have to give up their faith, so they become atheists. They think it's either evolution or creationism, so they go with evolution and leave religion behind. And this debate is still playing out today. In fact, in Canada, only 60% of the population believes that humans came from evolution. One-fourth of Canadians still believe in creationism. In the United States, nearly half the population still believes the universe 
and everything in it is 6,000 years old. In the U.S., more people believe that Obama is a Muslim than people who believe in evolution. Today, there are legal battles still going on over whether evolution should be taught in schools. Christians don't want their children being forced into evolution at school because they think that undermines their faith and everything they stand for. And evolutionists think, well, too bad. I'm sorry if you can't handle the truth. Perhaps natural selection will soon rid us of your stupidity. They don't say that. But I detected in the snark. And the war wages on. Creationism versus evolution. But what if there was another way? What if there was another way to still believe in the holy book, but not dismiss all the science books either? What if there was a way to believe in evolution and in God, a way to take both Darwin and Jesus seriously? What if God created through evolution? This view is called theistic evolution. Repeat after me, theistic evolution. I can already see you forgetting how to say it. So just turn to the person next to you and say it five times in a row. Theistic evolution, theistic evolution. <laughs> okay. Theistic comes from the Greek word theos, which means God. Whenever you hear me say theology or theological, that's coming from the same root word, theos. It means God. An atheist is someone who does not believe in God. You add the A in front of theos, and in Latin that negates it. A theos, not God. So atheistic evolution is evolution without God. And theistic evolution is evolution with God. God is involved in evolution Theistic evolutionists believe evolution and God are not enemies. Rather, evolution is how God created the species. Evolution is God's tool. Evolution basically says that over a long period of time, the inanimate dust and dirt and matter of this earth eventually evolved into life and single-celled organisms and eventually animals and then finally humans. Out of the dust and dirt, humanity evolved. And this actually lines up kind of cool with something the Bible says in Genesis. Genesis 1 says, quote, God scooped up the dust of the earth and breathed into it the breath of life. God created humanity from the dust, the dirt, the raw matter of the earth. Perhaps God and Darwin are not such enemies after all. In fact, one of the first people in history to argue for a sort of prototype of evolution was the Christian Saint Augustine. Remember him? Swift was the fall of Rome, so Augustine made heaven our true home. That same Augustine read Genesis back in the 400s AD, and he used it to argue for a form of evolution. Augustine looked at the Bible and said, why, didn't, why did God do it over seven days? Why didn't God just snap his fingers all at once and make the world in one second? Surely he's powerful enough, he's God. But instead, the Bible describes a process a change over time, an evolution over seven days. God creates the fish on one day, the animals on another, and humans near the end. So Augustine said that based on Genesis, the world is not static, not stationary, but changing, evolving. Augustine didn't even think the seven days were literal days, but metaphors for great periods of time over which God progressively created the world. In the New Testament, it does say, 
A day is like a thousand years to God, and a thousand years are like a day. And Augustine didn't just say this to try to force the Bible to fit in with modern science. He said this a thousand years before modern science was even around. Augustine is reading Genesis and getting evolution or something close to it 1,400 years before Darwin was even born. Perhaps the two stories of evolution and creation aren't so different after all. But what about the rest of the book of Genesis in the Bible? What about counting up the generations and the 6,000 years and it all being made in six days? How is that consistent with evolution? Genre. You've heard me say it over and over again. Genre. The Bible is not one book. It's actually dozens and dozens of different books written over thousands of years by different authors and in different genres. There's poetry. Letters, prophecies, songs, stories, history. And so, whenever you interpret a book of the Bible, you have to ask, what is its genre? The book of Acts that we began going through at the beginning of the series, that's the historical genre. It uses real historical names, times, dates, places, events that are also recorded in secular history. But if you tried to read the book of Psalms the same way you read the book of Acts, it wouldn't work. Because Psalms is a book of poetry that was meant to be sung out loud. It doesn't make sense when you try to read it as history. That was the problem with the Galileo thing, right? Galileo said the sun is the center and the earth revolves around it. But in Psalm 19, it said, the sun rises. And Christians were like, you're wrong, Galileo. And Galileo was like, no, you stupid people. Psalms is the genre of poetry, metaphor. Are we doing the same thing with Darwin as we did to Galileo? If you look at the book of Genesis, its genre is clearly poetry. I mean, just read it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light. There's vivid imagery and symbolism of light and dark. Even the whole seven days thing is a poetic device. It's poetic repetition. There was evening and there was morning, the first day. There was evening and there was morning, the second day. There was evening and there was morning, the third day. It's like a chorus in a song. The genre of Genesis is poetry. If you try to read it like a science textbook, or a history book, it's not going to make sense, because that's not what the author was trying to do. Now, poetry still has a literal point underneath. If poetry says, I love you with a burning love of a thousand suns that defeats my soul, if someone says that, there's not literally a burning sun in his soul, but there is a literal point, and the literal point is, I love you. And I'm using these poems, this imagery, to convey that truth. And with the book of Genesis, after all the light and darkness and great bangs and days, the underlying point that still is literal is that God created the world and that we have a place in it because God loves us. That's the real truth in the poetry. The rest is imagery and metaphor, attempts to put into words that which cannot be put into words. Theistic evolution still says God created everything. It still takes the Bible seriously. In fact, they would say they take the Bible even more seriously than the creationists because they take seriously the genre of each Bible book. What about all the suffering? What about Darwin's daughter Annie dying? What about the 99% of species that were deemed unfit and left behind? 
Where is God in that suffering? And that's a tough question. We're going to talk more about the question of suffering in a few weeks. But for now, let me say this. The question of suffering is not unique to evolution. For thousands of years before Darwin, Christians wrestled with why bad things happen. Why is there suffering and death? We've always believed that even when things are tragic and we don't understand what God is doing, somehow in the midst of that, God still has a plan and is at work. We've always believed God works through the pain. We've always believed that God weaves life out of death. We've always believed that God works through the darkness to bring about the light. Evolution doesn't introduce any new question or issue to the discussion. Evolution might seem random and chaotic and painful, but so is our daily lives. Our lives seem random and chaotic and painful, yet many of us still believe in God and that God works through that chaos. So why can't God also work through the seeming randomness and chaos of evolution? Whatever way you've made sense of the suffering you see in the world should apply just as much to the suffering you see in the fossil record. If you couldn't make sense of God and suffering in the first place, then evolution will just reaffirm what you already believe. But if you have managed to make sense of God and suffering, then learning about evolution shouldn't change anything. Evolution introduces nothing new to the suffering question. And so believing it as a Christian doesn't suddenly mean you've negated your faith. And so, those are your three options. Ta-da! Three possible explanations for how we got here. Creationism, atheistic evolution, theistic evolution, who created everything? Creationism says, God! Atheistic evolution says, evolution! Theistic evolution says, God used evolution! How old is everything? Creationism says, 6,000 years. Atheistic evolution says, 14 billion years. Theistic evolution says, hey, me too, 14 billion years. The Bible? Creationism says, literally true. Atheistic evolution says, <laughs> yeah, no. Theistic evolution says, the Bible is true, but you have to take its genre seriously. Taking something seriously doesn't always mean taking it literally. These are your three main options. Creationism, atheistic evolution, and theistic evolution. So what do you think? Which option is right? How did we get here? How you answer will dictate how you interpret the Bible, how you see yourself and your species, how you deal with science, how you deal with school and your biology class, how you understand the world around you, how you see God. And it will even affect how you see other Christians. Those who believe in creationism often don't get along with those who believe in theistic evolution, and vice versa. Churches have split over this issue. Pastors have been fired. I was very aware of that fact as I was preaching the sermon. Pastors have been fired over this issue. Millions of dollars has been used not to spread the gospel, but so we could argue with our fellow Christians about this question. I personally don't think that creationism and evolution should divide us. I don't think the truth of this issue is big enough to be worth undermining our unity. I don't think this is a primary issue. It's a secondary issue. So whether or not you pick creationism or theistic evolution, I still think we can worship together as one church. 
you can't pick atheistic evolution and still be a Christian. I mean, it, there's no God. <laughs> but between creationism and theistic evolution, I think you can hold either one and still be a legit Christian. Because at the end of the day, both still believe God created it, and I think that's what really matters. But what do you think? I want to invite you, not just to decide today what you think and never think about it again, but I want to invite you into a conversation. I want to invite you to wrestle with Darwin, with your culture, with yourself, with God, with each other, and with the origin of our species. How did we get here? In 1833, Jesus left and left us a mission. His spirit came to bring it to fruition. Then Peter pissed off the Sanhedrin, so Saul martyred Stephen. But Saul became Paul and went through many trials to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Soon, a new Bible began to form, its survival tested by a Gnostic swarm as Constantine took Rome by storm. Yet swift was the fall of Rome, so Augustine made heaven our true home. Dark ages, Quran's pages, the crusade rages on. Plagues here, deaths near, Dante, where have we gone? 1500s, Luther thunders. God's grace was louder than the Pope's indignation. Luther launched the Protestant Reformation. Secularism, get out of the public sphere. Naturalism, no miracle here. Revolution, freedom is near. Religion is the opium of the masses. Communism alone will unite the classes. Darwin, daughters, and evolution. Where does God fit in the modern revolution? Indeed, where does God fit in the modern revolution, the modern world, modern times, modernity? I mean, first, secularism removed God from the public sphere. Then naturalism removed God from science. Then Marx removed God from politics and economics, and now Darwin allegedly removed God from creation altogether. Darwin, daughters, and evolution. Where does God fit in the modern revolution? And next week, the trajectory, the direction of the modern age is finally going to catch up with us. In the next stage of AD history, the Western world is going to drop the charade. The crap is finally going to hit the fan. All hell is going to break loose. In the next stage of AD history, we are going to kill God. See you next week.